Today we're going to take a look at creating our knockback component for our weapon system. This is a simple component that lets us define an angle and a strength for a knockback and interacts with the component that implements the iKnockbackable interface on our enemies. So welcome to Bardent, my name is Heinrich, and let's jump into part 14 of the Unity multi-weapon system series. So as with all the previous weapon components that we've created so far, we're going to start by creating our three main scripts. So let's jump over to our editor. And let's start by coming to our weapons folder in our scripts folder, and then open up components, component data, and attack data. We'll start with the smallest unit. So in the attack data folder, let's go ahead and add a new C sharp script. And we're just gonna call this attack knockback. So this is the knockback definition for a single attack for a weapon. Let's go ahead and create that. And before we do anything in here, Let's go ahead and come to our component data folder, right click on that, hit add new C sharp class. And this one is going to be our knockback data. So the data for the entire component. Then finally, we can come to our components folder, right click on that, hit add new C sharp class. And this is just going to be the knockback component itself. So where the knockback logic of the weapon is going to reside. So just call it knockback. Now we can just go ahead and finish up the definitions for these classes. So let's again start with our attack knockback class. Go ahead and select this one. Now the first thing we want to do is this is the data that we define in our inspector. So we need to make sure that we tag this as a serializable. That way it'll actually show up in the inspector. So with that done, the next thing we need to do is make sure that this inherits from our attack data class. Now, before we move on to the other classes, let's just go ahead and add what our actual knockback data is going to be. Now, the first thing we're going to need is let's create a field, serialized field, public, vector2, and let's call this just the angle. And then don't forget to tag it with a public getter and a private setter. So this is the direction that the knockback is going to be applied in. The next thing we need is another field, serialize field, this time a public float called strength. And of course, don't forget the public getter and the private setter. So in this case, strength just defines how strong our knockback is. So the higher the strength, the further the enemy or whatever is getting knocked back will be hit. So that's all we need to do in our attack knockback class. Let's go ahead and come to our knockback data class. In here, we need to make sure that we're inheriting from our component data class. And our component data, if you remember correctly, is generic. And here we need to pass in what the specific attack data is, which is the class that we just finished. So we can say attack knockback. In here, we also need to define what our knockback data component dependency is. So what is the mono behavior that needs to be added to our weapon for this to function? Now, if we go ahead and just quickly take a look at one of our other components, take for example, our damage data class, you can see here that we have a public damage data constructor where we set our component dependency equal to type of damage. Now, the thing is when I was preparing for this episode, I forgot to do this um, because I had nothing reminding me to do this. It's been a while since I've worked on this series, so you forget things like this. So a better approach, instead of using a constructor here, is let's create a abstract function in our component data base class that we need to implement in our subclasses to make sure that we remember to do this whenever we create a new component data. So we're gonna just quickly refactor a little bit before we start working on the actual knockback component itself. So let's just go ahead and open up our component data base class over here. And you can see in the absolute base, so we have two classes in here. So one is the generic version that just inherits from our base component data class. And in the absolute base, <laughs> I'm probably overcomplicating this explanation, but so in the component data class, we have this public type variable that is our component dependency. Now you can see over here, we already have a component data constructor that calls this set component name function. So let's just go ahead and create another function. This is going to actually be protected 
instead of public. And usually if we wanted a subclass to be able to override this function, we would implement it as a public virtual or protected virtual function. But in that case, the subclass isn't required to override this function. In our case, we want it to kind of be like an interface. And that's exactly what our abstract is going to do. So we'll say protected abstract void and call it set component dependency. So as you can see now, abstract is giving us an error and that's because the class itself isn't an abstract class. So we can just go ahead and say public abstract class component data and everything's fine. And so this is okay because we're never planning on creating an object of just component data by itself. We're always going to create objects of the classes that inherit from component data. Another thing to take note of is that instead of having squiggly brackets at the end, we just have our semicolon. And that's because an abstract method or function cannot have a default implementation. And instead, our subclasses are going to be required to give this implementation. Now notice that our com generic component data class is also screaming at us, but we don't wanna implement this function here. We wanna implement it in the classes that actually inherit from this one. So to fix that, we can just also tag this as abstract. I'm not sure if tag is the, the correct word, but that's what I'm using for now. So now both of these classes are abstract, and because this is an abstract class, it is not required to implement this, but anything that inherits from component data will be required to implement this. So you'll notice if we open up our file explorer, all of our component data classes are now giving us errors because they don't have that function yet. We'll fix that in just a second. Before we go there, let's just come to our component data constructor, and after saying set component name, let's also call set component dependency. Now let's quickly go ahead and fix all of our errors. So let's start with our action hitbox data, open that up. And if we just click in component data and with writer, it should be the same official studio code, hit control full stop. We can say implement missing members. All that's doing is it's creating this function. So this is now protected override void set component dependency. And what I'm gonna do is simply move this down to here and then get rid of the constructor. So that takes care of the error in our action hitbox data. Let's go ahead and take a look at damage data. Again, we're gonna do the same thing. Just go ahead and implement the missing members and move this down here. Don't forget to get rid of this throw new not implemented exception. Don't need that. And just remove the constructor. Okay, so that should be all of our errors. You'll notice we still only have one and that is in our knockback data class. And so this is very handy because now that we have inherited from our generic component data class, we now know that we need to implement this function. So let's just go ahead and do the same thing over here. Let's go ahead and implement this missing member. And here we can set our dependency. So we can say component dependency equals type of and the type that we want is simply our knockback class that we created earlier. So that is all of our component data setup. We are now ready to work on the knockback component itself. So let's go ahead and open that up. And in here, the first thing we need to do is make sure that we inherit from weapon component. And this class takes in two generic parameters. The first one is the component data, which is knockback data. And the second is the class for the single attack data, which is attack knockback. Now let's talk about how knockback works. We have an interface that we created earlier in the series called iKnockbackable. You can see here that it's simply a single function called knockback that takes in an angle, a strength, and a direction. The angle just determines the arc of the knockback strength determines how far or how strong the initial knockback is, and direction simply accounts for whether we're facing left or right. Now, this interacts with our core components, specifically the knockback receiver, which came from our combat core component from the player controller series. So if we take a look at this, you can see here that it implements the iKnockback will interface, and it has this knockback function. And all that it does is it takes 
the strength angle and direction and passes it on to another core component that is responsible for setting the entity's velocity. It then simply also takes care of some other logic like checking when the knockback should be done. So just if you're not coming from the player controller series and you want to know how the actual knockback itself works, go ahead and take a look at this class specifically on the repository. Let's go back to our knockback component. Our knockback component is going to work very similarly to our damage component. Let's actually take a look at that instead. So over here, you can see our damage component has a reference to a hitbox component. So our damage component requires this action hitbox component to work. And what happens is the action hitbox component is simply responsible for defining a hitbox and detecting things within that hitbox. When it does detect something, it fires off an event that holds all the entities colliders that were detected. So you can see over here, that's why our handle function takes an array of collider 2D. What then happens is we simply loop through that list, look for all the I damageables, and then damage them. So we're going to be doing exactly the same thing with the knockback. We're going to take this list of collider 2Ds, or this array of collider 2Ds, loop through it, look for all the I knockbackables, and then call the knockback function. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's come back to knockback. And the first thing I want to do Let's create a private action hitbox and let's just call it hitbox. Next, we need to go ahead and actually set the reference to this component. So let's go ahead and create the start function, which you can see is going to be protected override because our base weapon component classes also implement the start function. And after base.start, we can say hitbox equals get component. And the type that we want to get is our action hitbox. Next, we need to go ahead and create the handler. So when our action hitbox fires off that event with the list of things that it detects, we need to handle that. So let's create a private void called handle detect collider 2D. And this takes in a collider 2D array called colliders. Next, before we implement any of this logic, we'll come back to our start function. And after we get the reference to our hitbox, we'll say hitbox.onDetectCollider2D plus equals handle detect collider 2D. So because we subscribe to this event, we need to make sure that we also unsubscribe from this event. And we're gonna do this in the onDestroy function. So go ahead and say protected override void on destroy. And after base.onDestroy, we can say hitbox dot on detect collider 2D minus equals handle detect collider 2D. Perfect. So now whenever the game starts, our component will look for this weapon component and subscribe to its event if it is there. Now we can go ahead and work on the actual logic over here. So like I mentioned before, it's exactly the same as our damage component from the previous episode, not the previous episode, two episodes ago or something. So what we want to do is create a for each loop that is going to loop through our colliders array. We can just say var, and I'm just gonna call it item. So in here, I'm gonna say for each item, if item.trygetComponent, so this is a function that's going to look for a specific component on this game object, and if it finds it, it'll return true. If it doesn't, it'll return false. And then as the input parameter, we're going to say out i knockbackable called knockbackable. So what happens is if we do find this component, this out keyword over here means that this knockbackable variable is now an object in this class that we can work with. So we can say knockbackable dot knockback. So here we now just need to pass in our knockback angle and our knockback strength and our direction. So the knockback angle comes from our current attack data dot knockback angle, or in this case, actually just angle, Strength is current attack data dot strength. And then finally, we need this int direction. Now, where do we get this from? So this is the facing direction of our entity, in this case, our player. And we get this from our movement core component. So that means we need to get a reference to our movement core component. So what we're going to do is by our variables, we're going to create a private core system dot movement. And the reason we need to say core system is because we also have a weapon movement component. So if we were to just say movement, it'll think we want the weapon system movement class. 
but no, we want the core system movement class, and we'll just call it movement. Next, we need to go ahead and actually set this reference, and we can do that in the start function. So in previous episodes with the core system, this is quite embarrassing, but if we take a look at just action hitbox data, wait, no, action hitbox over here, you can see we're using this core comp class that I created not that long ago. Um, and the reason we do this is because this core comp class has a bunch of functions, or it's a single function in here, that does something convoluted that is actually, I discovered recently, not necessary. So the whole reason we created this was we had a sequencing issue where sometimes we would try and get access to a core component before our core knew about that core component. And so it just wouldn't work. So what we would do is whenever we tried to access a core component variable, we would first look to see if that variable is null. If it is null, we would then go to the core itself and ask to get that core component. But we made some changes to the core, not that recently, that if we take a look at that, over here in this get core component function, what we said was if we look for the core component in this core components list that it has, and if it doesn't find it in there, before it would just return null. But we made a change recently where if it was null, and so we didn't find it in this list, we would first check to just see if we can find it ourselves. So we call this get component in children function. And so that means we no longer actually need this for comp generic class. It still works fine, so we don't need to refactor any of the places we've used it so far, but that means in our knockback class now, we can just go ahead and simply say movement equals core dot get core component, and then pass in our core system dot movement, like that, and that should work. Now, the only requirement here is that you can only call this once you've set the core to something. So because our core variable gets set in the awake function, we are safe to do this in start, and we don't have to do any other convoluted things around this. So super sorry about that. Everything still works fine. You can still use the other method if you want. Just know that we shouldn't have any sequencing issues anymore. Okay, so with a reference to our movement core component set, that means we can come up to the knockback function, and over here we just pass in movement dot facing direction. And so that's basically it for the knockback function. Next, we can go ahead and actually add the data to our weapon and let's try it out. So come back to Unity, come to your data folder. Let's start with sword one. Let's open up add components and let's add the knockback data class. If we expand this, we should have all three of our attacks. I'm just gonna make the angle 45 degrees for the first two attacks and then not sure what the angle for this would be, but something that points a bit more up for the third attack because it's that uppercut attack. And then let's make strength 10 for the first one, 10 for the second one, and 20 for the third one. Next, let's come to our sword 2. Go ahead and add component, knock back data, 1, 1, 10, 1, 1, 15, why not? Play around with these variables. So because of what we did in the previous episode, where our weapon component itself is automatically generated based on this data, we don't need to do anything else and we should be free to just test it now. So let's go ahead and run the game and let's hope everything works. So if we come to this guy, give him a hit, he got knocked back. Well, I'm not sure if he jumped, I don't think he did, but if we, yep, there we go. Our knockback is working. So you can see our third attack there really throws the guy into the air because of that extra strength and the higher angle. But there we go, simple as that. Now our weapons have the ability to knock back these enemies. Perfect. So that's gonna do it for this episode. I know it was probably a bit of a shorter one. Sorry that we're constantly refactoring a bunch of stuff. I know it must be quite annoying, but I'm learning at the same time you guys are. And sometimes we just do dumb things in the past and it's important to be able to recognize it and fix it when you've gained new knowledge. So that's going to do it for this part. If you would like access to the prototype that I'm using for this series, you can find that over on my Patreon. It is accessible to all of my Patreon tiers. And with that being said, I would just like to say thank you to all of my supporters and wonderful people over on Patreon. And a huge special thank you to Cody Lee, SM, Major Sins, Jake Scarupa, Patrick, Atami, Mike Rodriguez, and Nathan Ackley. You guys are absolute mad lads. 
and I hope you all have a wonderful day.